Well, for my keynote this morning, I wanted to address something that whether you want to be a speaker or a writer or even effectively teach a Bible study or just write a blog or whatever it is that you're wanting to do, whenever you put yourself in a place to have readers or an audience of any kind, there's a lot of fear or nerves that can come along with that. I understand that a lot. As a matter of fact, Psychology Today released an article and the article was, The Thing We Fear More Than Death. I'm just gonna read you a little part of this article because if you have ever experienced a little bit of fear or a whole lot of freak out before you stepped in front of an audience or before you hit post or publish, this is for you. Surveys about fears commonly show fear of public speaking at the top of the list. Our fear of standing up in front of a group and talking is so great that we fear it more than death, at least according to some surveys. And I have to say, I get it because when I felt called to be a speaker and a writer, I always knew that I love to put words together and I enjoyed giving book reports in front of my class when I was a little girl. But when I first started being a speaker, I think the biggest mistake that I made is I imagined the wrong audience. So if you're a note, a note taker and you wanna write down a title for this message, title it, Who is in Your Audience? Because if you were to ask me today, Lisa, what is the one thing that you changed that helped you stand in front of people, whether the group was 10 people or 10,000, and feel like you weren't gonna have a complete anxiety attack? I think I have something that can really help you. If you were to ask me today, Lisa, when you've released a book before, you've said, on that day of release, it's kind of like putting on a bathing suit and feeling like you're standing in front of the entire world slightly naked. So how do you actually do that? I would say, I think today's message is gonna answer that question. Because for a long time, I imagined the wrong audience. You see, I thought, when you get up to give a message or when you wrote a book, I thought that you needed to see a crowd of people. I envisioned all the masses listening to me speak and I envisioned all the massive amount of readers that were gonna eventually read my book. And so I designed my messages for a crowd and that was the wrong audience. Because while you are absolutely, if you have a few people gathered or thousands of people gathered, while you absolutely are speaking to a crowd, I get it. If you think about speaking to a crowd, you will on some level experience pretty extreme anxiety, especially when you're getting started. But instead of a crowd, if you remember that whether there's 10 people or 10,000, that crowd is made up of individuals. And if you speak to the individual that needs your message, you won't be nearly as nervous. Also, when you're writing a book, if I sit down and I write a book and I picture thousands of people reading my book, I will write it as if thousands of people are gathered together in a group, but that's not how people read. When I read a book, it's often late at night when I'm super tired and I'm not always super proud of all the decisions that I've made that day and I'm looking for a little pick-me-up, you know what I'm saying? And so I go to my bed and I hop in my bed and I have my book on my nightstand and I pick up that book and I don't want that writer to speak to me as if I'm a massive crowd that's as confident and assured about my life as if I am a political figure with a crowd of people raging 
about how much they love me because that's not the way my life works. There aren't crowds of people in my everyday life telling me they're super proud of me. And there aren't little people rising up to call me blessed. They want food, they want their house cleaned, and they want to go somewhere. So if that writer speaks to me and they speak to me as if I'm a multitude of people super confident, I'm not gonna engage with that message because I'm not a crowd of people, I'm one person. And more than my confidence, what I'm really hyper aware of are my issues. And more than wanting to be inspired or even informed, I wanna be understood. So I want that writer to speak to me like the very best friend with the very best advice that I wish was sitting right here next to my bed, but isn't. And friends, I think sometimes when we decide that we wanna communicate, because we're thinking about the crowd so much, it hurts the authenticity of our message. Somebody texted me a funny question recently and they said, Lisa, what is your superpower? And I thought to myself, I don't have a superpower. And then the hyper-spiritual part of me said, my superpower is the Holy Spirit, of course. But I knew that's not what they were wanting for me to reply with. So I thought about it and I thought, I don't really consider that I have any kind of superpower. But if you forced me to give you an answer, I would say my superpower is vulnerability. And with it, I guess, I rise, and with it I fall, and with vulnerability I rise up again. And I guess in some way that's helped me remember who's really in my audience. It's one person, one person who chances are they're hurting and they need a friend and they need to know that someone understands them and gets their pain, and if I think about one person in my audience and I really picture it as having a conversation with a friend, I've never shown up at a coffee house to have a conversation with a friend and felt the same kind of nerves that I do sometimes when I'm about to step on a stage. And so, if I don't think about this as preaching a message to a crowd, but rather a conversation with a friend that helps me so much. The other mistake that I made early on in being a communicator is that I thought when I took the stage that I didn't just need to have a conversation, that I needed to command attention and convince people in the audience of certain things the problem is, is that I would think of people in my life and what I wanted to convince them of. And so it forced something about my message that shouldn't be forced. I thought about my parents and I especially thought about my dad that left that never came back. And I thought, if he's in the audience today, I wanna make him proud. So that's how I would take the stage, trying to prove that I could make somebody proud. I thought about a group of girls in school that never made me feel accepted. I, I thought about one time I ran for office um, for our student council and um, I don't know why I ran for office because before I even ran, I knew I wasn't in the popular crowd and I knew I wouldn't win, but I have such a Pollyanna view of life. All of my friends know this, that I constantly dream up things that are a little bit outside of reality. And in some ways that has served me well, but on this particular season of middle school, it did not serve me well because while I knew I probably wouldn't win, I envisioned how amazing my life would be when I would win. And I held uh, just this stance the whole time that I was certain that I would get elected. And then 
I didn't. Whoa. And someone took one of my handmade posters at my middle school where I'd said, vote for Lisa, and they wrote loser across the poster. And so that day when I walked down the hall in middle school, I remember thinking, one day I'm gonna do something that makes them accept me. And you know, you can take the girl <laughs> out of middle school, but sometimes it's hard to take the middle school out of the girl. But if you stand up on that stage, that platform, that pulpit, and you're so desperate for the crowd to accept you, you'll write your message for the wrong reasons. You'll imagine the wrong audience and you'll deliver something that makes you so nervous and so vulnerable because instead of knowing that you're stepping up to accept an assignment from God, instead, you're taking the stage hoping to get something from your audience. And when you're desperate to get acceptance, you'll deliver a message that if it goes well, you'll get a false sense of acceptance. And if it doesn't go well, you'll feel more rejected than you've ever felt in your whole life. Because if we take the stage and we're holding this little heart-shaped bucket and we place it up at the front of the stage and we ask the audience, please give me something. Give me the affirmation that you're proud of me or give me the acceptance that I never felt or give me proof that I deserve to be up here or show me that I have pretended to be perfect enough or that I've postured myself in such a way that I have perfectly imitated all my favorite speakers and since you love them, you love me and now I've really made it and so I'm setting this heart-shaped bucket in front of you and I'm begging my audience for something what a tragic day it is for that audience because they didn't come there to give you something. They came there because they thought you were gonna give them something. But if I settle all this stuff, if I'm, if I'm standing in front of my audience and I'm not trying to prove or pretend or posture or preach a, a point that I'm desperate to make because I'm on some sort of personal soapbox or if I'm, if I'm not trying to prove how wronged I was or, or even prove how much I deserve to be in this place right now, if I don't do all of that, but instead I settle all of that, not on a stage, but in my prayer closet and I, I let God tend to my soul and fill me up and remind me what this assignment is really about. And then I settle my emotional issues by, by going to counseling and making the investment into my own development and maturity and self-awareness, then my bucket is full and I carry it up to that individual in the audience and I'm able to pour it out. And it creates a life-giving moment for that one person. And if I've done that for that one person, and I've helped them, I've reassured them, and I've connected with them, that's that beautiful conversation with a friend that that one person will never forget. And even if the whole crowd claps and gives you a standing ovation, that's not what fills you because the applause dies so quickly it's the letter that you get from that one person. 
that everything changed for them because you dared to take the stage just for them. That's where you feel fulfilled. That's where your purpose that God has given you, that's where, that's where that purpose is honored. And that's where, when you get to heaven, you'll hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, that you weren't so enamored with the crowd that you forgot about that one, the one that needed what you had to give. So when I stand up in front of an audience now, I don't think about the crowd and it changes how I feel about my message. Now, I didn't learn this because I saw a speaker that did this in such a way that cracked open their heart and poured this wisdom into me. No, I, I actually saw this and really got this message in the most unlikely way. Jenna Bush Hager, who, if you've ever read my book, The Best Yes, I called her affectionately the most non-chaotic woman I've ever met in my entire life. She is an absolute delight. Before I ever met her, I had seen her through the years grow up in the White House, and I guess I made certain assumptions about how surely she must be utterly convinced at how important she is. But when she became a correspondent for the Today Show, the Today Show sent her to my house to do a story, an interview with my family about our adoption. And so Jenna knocked on my door that day. She was quite pregnant with her first child. And um, she had her notes in one hand and a coffee cup in the other hand. And she wasn't so polished and put together, although on the outside she was gorgeous and everything about her seemed so perfect, but her, her, the air about her was so casual and so comfortable. Right away she made me forget that she had been raised in the White House. And she came in and not only was she there to be the interviewer with the Today Show, but the New York Times had actually sent a reporter to interview Jenna about being a correspondent for the Today Show. So there was a lot going on. There was a lot of people that I'm sure Jenna could have been tempted to impress. But when she got there, she made a beeline for one of my boys. And she said, hey, before we get started with the interview today, do you mind if we just sit down on the couch and have a conversation? And so Jenna took my son over to the couch in my den and sat down and acted as if he were the one person in the room. Not just the one person in the room, the most important person in the room. And what astounded me is how amazing our God is that this woman who grew up as the child of the President of the United States, she called the White House her house she was sitting with my son, who just a few years before that was a forgotten orphan in a forgotten orphanage in a third world country, the poorest of the poor. And look what God did. He arranged the entire universe. He, he put together this most unlikely conversation between the poorest of the poor and the most influential of all the influences. And he brought them together and I got to see how beautiful it is when somebody doesn't focus on the crowd, but sees 
the individual. It reminds me of this verse in Psalm 113. Actually, the whole, the whole Psalm 113 is so beautiful. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, His glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth. And if we would just remember, that's who called us to this. This magnificent God who from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, he has it all under control. And if he's called you, he will equip you. And if he's equipped you, then you be faithful to remember how much God himself sees and understands and notices the individual. And then watch what Psalm 113 goes on to say in verse seven. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. That's the God we serve that would care so much about my son that he would allow my son to live out this verse, the poorest of the poor, having a conversation with someone who in America would be the princess of the first family. And he brought them together. And when he did, Jenna, the one who was in charge of the conversation, knew this so well, and she handled her responsibility so beautifully because she had a conversation with the one who needed it, and it was beautiful. Friends, when you stand up in front of an audience or you're writing a book that will one day be published, or even if you're publishing an Instagram post today, I think it will change so much for you if you don't think about the crowd, but instead think about the one individual who's holding her phone, reading your post, feeling as if she's not gonna survive, but then she reads her, your words, and for the first time that day, she thinks, but maybe I will. You see, your audience is crying out for something when you take that stage or when you write that book. They wanna know three crucial things. Number one, that individual sitting there, she wants to know that you care enough to see her. She's crying out to you, see me. Notice me, give me something that will help me today. I think it's probably been a very long time since she's felt like someone, anyone, had a clue at how invisible she feels and how absent she seems even from her own emotions. I think it's been a very long time since someone has made eye contact with her and said to her, you matter. So when you take that stage, don't let your eyes scan the room and become so enamored with the crowd. Because if you do, you will speak differently with less tenderness and less compassion and less authenticity. And if vulnerability is a superpower, you will lose it. Because the only way to be truly vulnerable is to look someone straight in the eye. So you find her when you take that stage and you look at her and then just so she doesn't get completely creeped out that you're looking at her the whole time, go and find another individual and look at her 
and go and find another individual and look at her. And maybe you're saying, but Lisa, what if these people in my audience, they, they don't care if I see them. You're wrong. They do. Every human longs to be noticed. And when you notice them and you see them, you give them such a great gift. So number one, she's crying out, see me. Number two, she's crying out, understand me. Understand me. She may say that she came to your speaking engagement that night so that she could be instructed or inspired or maybe even entertained. But more than that, first, before you're able to teach her anything, she needs to know that you can understand where she's at. She's saying, understand me, because if you don't understand me and you don't know what I'm really going through, if you don't know the depth of my pain and the depth of my struggle, then I cannot possibly trust that your advice is gonna work for me. But if you, as the speaker, if you help her see that she's not the only one that feels that way, if you understand her and her pain so well, then you as the communicator can give her the greatest gift. And that is being able to verbalize exactly what she's been feeling, but she's never been able to put it into words. And when you do put it into words, her life suddenly falls into place. And it's amazing because you've just expressed, sister, you're in pain and this is what you feel like. And then when you really understand her pain and you help her identify the problem that's actually causing that pain and you do it with great vulnerability and great authenticity because you've been right there just like her, even if your circumstances are different than hers, so much of our pain that's underneath the circumstances is exactly the same. You don't have to walk through the exact circumstances that I've walked through to know how much betrayal hurts because somewhere along the line, you got betrayed too. You don't have to know exactly what I've been through. You don't have to have the exact same circumstances as me to know what shame feels like because you felt shame too all those underlying pain points that we carry and experience in life, those are your connection points to your audience. And your brilliance isn't gonna be that you're the best expert in the world. Your brilliance is gonna be that you understand them and that you're willing to be brave enough to help them put words to the feelings that they've had that they've never known how to put words to. In my book, Forgiving What You Can't Forget, it's a book that I've been working on for the past couple of years, and it doesn't come out until November, but I knew writing a book on forgiveness, the most foolish thing that I could do starting off this book would be to come out and to speak to a crowd of people as if they were in the mood today to hear someone remind them that they should forgive. That would have been a terrible place to start. So that's not where I started. I started with the pain that we're surely in when forgiveness is the eventual answer, but forgiveness feels more like a cuss word than something you'd find in the Bible. So I spoke to the individual. Do you ever find yourself defining life by before and after the deep hurt, the horrific season, the conversation that stunned you, the shocking day of discovery, the stunning call about the accident, the divorce, the suicide, the wrongful death so unfathomable you still can't believe that they're gone? The malpractice, the breakup, the day your friend walked away, the hateful conversation, 
the remark that someone made that now seems to be branded on your soul, the taking of something that shouldn't have been theirs, it was yours and they took it anyways, the brutality unleashed on the one you love, the email you were not supposed to see, the manipulation, the violation, the false accusation, the theft, the fire, the firing, the day, everything changed. That marked moment in time like your own personal BC and AD, which usually means before Christ and Anno Domini. But now for you, it feels like before crisis and after devastation. It's a line in time, one that's so sharply drawn across your reality. It not only divides your life, but it splits open your memory bank and defiles it. Pictures, of the past are some of our most priceless treasures until they become painful reminders of what no longer is. And when your phone randomly sends those memory movies from what happened on this same day four years ago, it stops you from breathing. Life before, life now, is it even possible to move on from something like this? Is it even possible to create a life that's beautiful again? Some part of what you loved about your life exploded and in that moment marked you with this unwanted reference point of before and after. Friend, I get what this feels like. I cried about it again today. And it's not because something else is wrong in my life. There's so much right about my life, but it's about not being able to figure out what to do when you cannot forget what happened. And forgiveness, ugh, it feels like such a dirty word. So I'll raise my hand here and I will admit, that's why I cried today. And if you relate to this and you know how awful it is to define one's life with the words before and after, then I get you. And if no one else in this world has ever been kind enough to say this, I will. I am so, so sorry for all that happened to you. You see, when I do that, that helps that person who's not in the mood for forgiveness, they're too hurt for that, but it helps them uncross their arms and lean in and say, you get me, you understand me. And if you struggle with forgiveness to the point where you'd say it feels like a dirty word, then maybe I can trust the advice that you're about to give me. But it doesn't happen with someone who's standing up so confident that they speak to the crowd and so desperate for the crowd's approval that they are building up for the entire moment where the crowd jumps to their feet and applauses and says, how great you are, speaker, communicator, writer. That will never ever reach the depth of your audience's hurt and pain. That individual will clap and they will smile and they will leave feeling more intimidated by your perfection than helped in their pain. And applause might feel so great in that minute that you're getting it but it'll leave you so empty because it's kind of like eating sugar. It feels so good going down, but inside of you, it's not gonna nourish your body. Just like applause will never ever give you the assurance that you fulfilled your purpose. It won't. The crowd can't do that for you. Only recognizing that individual that needs desperately to know they aren't alone in this world. And when you take your pain and you use it 
with great compassion to reach out and help another person see that pain is not the end of their story. Pain is the pointing to a greater purpose in their life. And when you do that for them, that kind of fulfillment will leave you going to bed at night satisfied, hearing the Lord say, well done, well done. So she needs you to say that you see her and that you understand her. And probably most important of all, even after all of that, she needs you to help her. She's sitting there saying, see me, understand me and help me. You don't have to solve all of her problems, but you need to help her move forward. Give her permission to see a life beyond where she's at. Show her practically how to get from pain to making some choices that she can start to find healing and momentum and moving forward in her life. Help her have one better perspective. Help her make one better choice today. Help her to smile and laugh and remember what it means to have a life where sorrow is present, but celebration can coexist. You can give her that gift and it will change everything for her because you were brave enough to remember that you're not enamored with the crowd or terrified by the crowd, but that you care for her that you see her, that you understand her, and that you are willing to help her. Why am I so passionate about this message? Because I have a feeling that I'm gonna be her sitting in your audience. I'm gonna be her sitting in the midst of some hard and horrific thing that I don't even know is coming into my life. I will be her, I will be sitting there, and I'll be so desperate for you to see me, for you to understand me, and for you to help me, help me get into God's Word, show me where to go, so that I can turn the proof of how wronged I was into a perspective that will change everything. Help me find peace. Help me with your experiential wisdom and help me remember I'm not a victim. I am a woman who through the power of the Holy Spirit and the mercy of God and the grace and truth of Jesus Christ can move from victim to walking in victory. I'm passionate about you remembering who's seated in your audience and reading your books, because one day I will be her. And I'm so grateful that you will be you. And that's what I wanna see most of all, when you take that stage, you being authentically you, not desperate for me to give you something, but so filled up with the desire to see and understand and help the individual that you pour out onto me life-giving hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.